Hi, good evening. I'm Dr. Philip McMillan, and I'm able to start now because uh, Nuts and Bolts has said that he is here. So wonderful. Thank you. Now, um, I'm going to be talking about uh, the heart health after vaccination and sugar. Now, this is a piece of research that I had done after seeing an absolutely fascinating paper looking at the outcomes of PET scans in vaccinated versus unvaccinated patients. This was standout piece of research. And what I'll be trying to do is to take that research and link it to potentially what we are seeing here. So this is the image that I'll be using, PET scan before and after vaccination. I'll come back to this in just a few minutes, but it's to highlight that this is occurring after mRNA vaccines and to ask whether or not this is relevant to why Novak Djokovic is still at the top of his game. I've been watching some tennis recently and He's 37 years old. He just looks unstoppable. Now, he's only, um, if you're watching the Wimbledon at this moment, he is now going into the quarterfinals, so he could still lose. But he is still performing at such a high level. And it raises the question, did he do the right thing when he chose to not be vaccinated at the time? So I wanted to share a few ideas about what he said in 2022, the BBC article. Um, but again, before I start, I'd just like to encourage you, if you want to hear cutting edge information, interviews that you can't see on mainstream, please, you must join us on our newsletter because that's where we can send information out to you. But this has really fascinating topics. This one here is talking about global um, rise in penile cancer. Before we covered Alzheimer's, before that we are looking at immune responses, excess mortality. So these are all the newsletters that have been going before. Join us in this journey because we are building a community here of people who are interested in looking beyond the simple science to understand what may be happening and how it's relevant to the world today. So by the end of this, I'd also want to make sure that you have signed up for this course because I'm just making reference to this course about the vaccinated induced abnormal heart physiology and explaining it in detail. It's at a discounted price. If you want to understand the science, please join us again in this journey. So let's get back to this story because as I said, I've been watching tennis and really been fascinated by it. And you have here in 2022, and I'm going to be playing a section from it. This is where Novak Djokovic was interviewed by the BBC. You can see here, this was February 2022. And he was sharing some of his perspectives as to why and what he did uh, in terms of not getting vaccinated and having to miss some of the uh, competitions. And if you remember at the time in Australia, he wasn't allowed to perform. Uh, he wasn't allowed to play. He was actually deported from Australia. And it still affects him to today. And so it's interesting to hear his perspective about what he did, why he did it, and just to get some insight. So I'm just going to share with you that clip, and then I'll come back to what I think is the science about what is going on. I'm not here to sympathize with you, but I do want to understand you better. And I can imagine listening to you that your experience in that detention hotel was far from pleasant. Can you just talk us through what it was like? It, well, definitely it wasn't pleasant, but, you know, I don't want to be sit here and, 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 and complaining about conditions in that detention center because I stayed seven days. Did you feel powerless? Yes, I did feel powerless. I, when I arrived, I, you know, I was not allowed to use my phone for three, four hours. It was the middle of the night from 1 a.m. to 9 a.m. I uh, didn't get any sleep because I, I was going through questioning every 30 minutes, basically. You know, I had <laughs> many, many interviews that were started and then stopped and then paused. And then I waited for the person to speak to his superiors and he would come back. And it, it went on for the entire night. The visa was reinstated. Uh, first revoked and reinstated and revoked again. So I was free for four days and I was 
And so it's important to see what he went through at that time in the context of the um, in the context of the the pandemic. Um, he was held in a facility and he was unable to go and practice at the time. So it was very difficult for him. But what really was his reason for standing up in that way and risking, in a sense, risking what it was that happened to him at that time? And it's interesting, again, um, for him to share some of his thoughts about why he took that stance in the context of risking his career. So again, let's uh, listen to Novak uh, making his, uh, his comments here. What would you say to the ordinary Australian listening to you now, who has endured immense sacrifices and restrictions on their liberty over the past couple of years, but who looks at you and says, based on what they see in the news, this guy thinks he's above the law. He thinks that he doesn't have to abide by the same rules as everyone else. Australia has, has been through one of the most severe lockdowns that we had since the beginning of the pandemic. So I can only imagine how hard it was for Australians. And I sympathize, empathize with all the people. And I understand that there, there has been a lots of, uh, say, frustrations from Australian people towards me and towards the entire uh, situation and the way it was dealt with and uh, I understand it as well reading the newspapers you get certain conclusions um, but I would like to say that I always follow the rules and uh, um, the circular email that was uh, sent to me and to all the athletes that were going to uh, potentially going to Australia uh, I received it and there was a possibility for medical exemption and I was ready not to go to Australia. I mean, as much as I love the country, you know, and, and I always looked forward to go to Australian summer and participate in Australian Open, uh, it was a very difficult decision for me because I understood that um, with the decision that I made, there's going to be consequences. And that consequence is me not going to Australia. And I was ready. I really want to. I really want to understand your thinking behind that decision. Just before we go on to that, on this subject of the rules. So when the Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison says there should be no special rules for Novak Djokovic, you agree with him? Uh, I agree that there shouldn't be any special rules. I never used my privileged status to uh, get into Australia by force or do anything in this entire process. So I was treated as uh, anybody else, uh, really. And as I mentioned, the circular email that my team has received was sent to all the athletes, both male and female, both qualifications and main draws. So it was hundreds of tennis players receiving that email. So it's important to note that uh, Novak is, I think when I looked at the research, there were only three professional tennis players who weren't vaccinated, Novak being one of them. So over 98% were fully vaccinated. Now, this is where the science comes in. And my question is, is it therefore coincidental as to what we are seeing here? So I'm going to show you the ATP rankings since 2019. And I'm then going to try and analyze the ATP rankings in the context of this question about the physiological changes that happen in the heart. Tennis players, the difference between them is so small between a top tennis player and somebody who is in the 30s. When you see them play, it literally is down to slight differences in terms of their performance. And so they are performing at such a high level that anything that impacts them is going to have outcomes in their results. So let's look at the ATP rankings here. So this was from 2019. At the top here, we have Nadal, Djokovic, Federer. These are the three big guys going down. I want you to notice Medvedev here, as well as uh, there is another person. He'll come up in a little bit. Actually, um, he's a little bit lower down in the rankings in 2019. Um, but just remember those four for the time being. We have Medvedev here, Federer, Djokovic, Nadal. So that's 2019. Then in 2020, this is now when the pandemic has taken off. Now Djokovic is one, Nadal is two, 
Medvedev is still right there. And you can see that going down the line a little bit is Federer, but he probably wasn't playing as much. And he's a little bit older. He's about, I think, five years older than Djokovic and probably about four years older than Nadal. Then in 2021, we have here, Djokovic is still number one. Medvedev here, the Russian here, is number two. And down here is Nadal. And off the page at the moment is Roger Federer, number 16. Now, 2021 is important because that's the year that we had the rollout of the vaccine and the beginning of the mandates. And the two people at the top remain there. So when we go now and we continue now into 2022, and again, this is ATP rankings 2022, you can still see Nadal is up there. Djokovic is down, but largely because he couldn't perform in some of the events. And then there is Medvedev as well. And then we have in 2023, here we have Djokovic at the age of 37, still number one. And look here, Medvedev is number three. So he's hung around. He's not a young player. And this is a point, is the young players are struggling to keep up. The other one I was mentioning here was Rubilev. Now, why this is relevant is because if they are Russian, there's a strong possibility, not necessarily um, proven, that they had a whole virus vaccine if they had to travel. Djokovic was unvaccinated, and this is 2023. Why do I think that this is relevant? That's where it now comes down to the science. And to get the full details, you'll have to look at the course. But if you just work with me with regards to what it was I was looking at at the time. So this bit of research about the, um, the PET scans, and um, a PET scan is where we label glucose, we inject it, and then we observe where it's taken up in the body. And usually you're doing it in cancer screening because um, cancer cells tend to have high levels of glucose. They pull in a lot of glucose. So they then did a study looking at that, just coincidentally because there was a question about myocarditis after vaccination. They thought, why don't we look at these PET scans? And this is what they found. When they looked at it, so this is the assessment of myocardial uh, 18F FDG uptake in PET scans in asymptomatic patients, vaccinated and non-vaccinated. Really interesting study. Now, this is where your heart is. And you can see this person here didn't have a vaccine, is 43 years old. There is no significant uptake. You can see uptake in the brain, which is what we expect. Uh, you can see uptake down here in the kidneys. That's what we expect. Heart here, this is an 80-year-old man, unvaccinated. Again, no uptake, significant uptake in the heart. But look at this. In a 38-year-old man, high uptake of glucose in the heart. Similar pattern in a 72-year-old man. These two are vaccinated. So what they noticed was that after six months, I think by six months, it started to wane. But for a period of about six months, there was a significant change in terms of glucose uptake. The question is, was that a good or a bad thing? So this is where the science comes in. Now, in order to understand this, you have to know how the heart works. It beats all the time. And what you have, I've got here in these images, these here represent mitochondria. The mitochondrial content of heart muscle is extremely high. And it's because it needs so much energy to beat all the time. So anything that interferes with mitochondrial function can affect the energy utilization in the heart muscle. And this is how it usually works. In terms of energy, this is the important bit. The heart tends to use fats, not glucose. Glucose, carbohydrates, only 10 to 40%. The majority, up to 90%, is free fatty acids. And that's because you get much greater bang for your buck from a fat molecule than you do from a glucose molecule. So when you then think about this, why would the heart transition from using the most efficient form of energy to a less efficient form of energy? And that's really the question. 
And when we reflect on it, and now when you understand that, it would help you to see why this is such an important question. Look again. This heart is still using primarily fat. A little bit of glucose, 10%. This heart as well is primarily using fat. Very little glucose. But post-vaccination, this heart is using high amounts of glucose, not as much fat. Same here for the 72-year-old. What it means is that the heart is less efficient. Does that therefore have an impact in the context of professional athletes? That's really the question, because what it means is that if this was to be occurring even slightly in the context of professional athletes, one who is unvaccinated, therefore, would remain at peak performance. The person who has that occur, and it doesn't happen in everybody, but if it did happen, they would find that their capacity, their endurance, so normally they may have to play five sets. They may be fine for four, even four and a half, but they just can't make the fifth set because the differences are quite subtle. And it raises the question back to the point. Is this why at this point, 37 years old, Novak Djokovic is still number one? I mean, he's number two for, um, for the, um, the Wimbledon. But in 2023, he was number one still performing at a high level. It asks the question for this person, if he had the Russian Sputnik vaccine, which is a whole virus vaccine, this, was, this change was specific to mRNA um, vaccines. We don't fully know why. That's what the course is about. The course is about trying to explain the mechanisms in terms of what could be going on. So if you want to hear the theoretical side as to the different kinds of mechanisms, please click on the link in the description below. But it raises the question, when we look now forward at the Olympics, again, where you have athletes who have been focused and trying to go to the limit of their capability, very slight, subtle differences in heart function could have an impact on their overall performance, especially for distance and endurance events. So it's just a good question. Why does the heart after the vaccine, the mRNA vaccine, require higher amounts of glucose in order to be efficient? We don't know, but it does raise the question whether or not someone like Novak Djokovic, who is unvaccinated, has an advantage going into the future. We will see what happens with regards to the Olympics. It should be an interesting question to observe. Have a great evening.